earlier, but I was actually sharing this with a first year teacher a few years back. Teaching is enough. I am a culture builder in this school and I do make a difference. And even just, you know, people picking up the Victoria Advocate today, they are privy now to the great things going on in this campus because I decided, hey, I want to help out this district leader with this project. And I am just a teacher and being just a teacher, I believe, is just enough. Well, I like the way you 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 characterized yourself there. Culture builder. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the voice of the teacher. I'm your host, Jacob Montag. This is a continuation of our culture builder series. We're currently discussing the mindset of a successful educator with my good friend, Jonathan Sixtos. If you missed any of our previous parts, be sure to check the links below and then I'll take you to the previous videos. I would highly encourage you to watch them in order. We're doing these in 10 to 15 minute increments for your uh, viewing and listening convenience. So, we hope that this series will be a blessing to you, will be an inspiration to you. Share it with a colleague who's really down right now. Uh, share it with a, an, an instructional leader on your campus because ultimately we hope that this series will put, put us all on a better frame of mindset wherever we are uh, conducting our respective educational journeys at. So sit back, relax, and let's get ready to continue our upcoming conversation about what it takes to be a successful teacher entitled Culture Builders. <music> let's talk about the teacher transition movement. Cause you just mentioned that teacher that quit Christmas time. Um, obviously you probably can't share everything cause you probably don't know everything about that. But like you, we saw years ago an early pattern of teachers making an exodus, be it when Victoria had the oil field boom in the, in the late two thousands and, and teachers went to go make some money and then come back whenever it, it went down and then now recently, you actually have a hashtag. So if you have a hashtag, it's a movement, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so tra teacher transition, hashtag teacher transition. What are your thoughts on that? Is it just people not finding their niches? Is it a breakdown between leadership and the teachers? Um, lack of culture? Is it the kids? Because I actually, I, I've heard several different reasons. So like, what do you, what do you think it is? I think that I know this is kind of a cop out answer. I think it's difficult to categorize everyone's experience because yeah. in the same way that every district is different. I mean, even every high school is different. We've got two, we've got East and we've got West and they're radically different, even though they're only five miles apart. Oh, I think yeah. that there's several factors. And from my experience, um, I'm not dissing anyone as the kids would say, <laughs> but I do think that there are some people who found out that teaching is not their calling. And I don't mm. think that that's a bad thing. I don't think that anyone who leaves the classroom is a failure, just in the same way we don't think anyone who fails a state test is a failure. I feel mm. like a failure is someone who has completely given up. But the fact that you've moved on from teaching doesn't mean you've given up. Anybody who's gainfully employed still hasn't given up. So maybe that's not your fit. I mean, we don't say that athletes who change sports or change leagues, we don't say that they're failures. We just say they found their fit. And I do think that some teachers, if they were in it, maybe for the wrong reasons, very few and far between have I seen people who are actually in it just to get summers off. I actually haven't taken a summer off in the 10 years, whether it's summer school or curriculum writing or conferences. But I think that we are seeing people who are finding their limits. And I think there are some people who have adjusted their limits because knowing that I always wanted to be a teacher growing up made me aware, okay, what kind of systemic inequities do I need to prepare for? Not to the point of being abusive, saying, well, I'm just going to take it because I need this job or I need to be a teacher, but being willing to say, am I going to be a culture builder and try and save this situation? But also having the maturity to say, this situation that I'm currently in, not education on the whole, because I mean, how in the world can you pigeonhole the entire aggregate United States or global education system and saying this particular situation is not healthy for me? And hats off to the people who are in those situations and saying, for me, my health, my family, my finances, I'm going to move somewhere else. Now, I'm not obviously coming for admin with pitchforks and torches, but I admit that there are some districts and some schools where the culture is corrupted. And either it requires a top-down systemic change from admin or from school boards, and sometimes you got to just kind of give it a good wash. <laughs> Or it requires a number of culture builders to really dig in and say, we are going to save this from the roots. And every district is different. So in some places like 
in this school, we have a situation where we have very supportive administration and very excited teachers. And I'm aware of schools in the crossroads area where, I mean, you've got turnover rates where you've got to replace 60, 80, 90 teachers a year and all APs and all principals leave. And it's a whole new admin team that comes in. And these are just situations that happen. I've been very blessed to work for good principals, good assistant principals in a really cohesive department and really just a fun team. Like the English team that I've been on or the teams that I've been on over the years, we've had so much fun and appropriate fun. You know, like I said, meeting those goals and striving for those uh, improvement levels and just having joy in the job. And if someone's not finding joy in the job, then there's nothing wrong with finding a new job. Uh, I just right. don't, I don't agree when people try to pigeonhole or generalize and say, well, everyone needs to get out and all these teachers and nobody respects us because everything's different. I'm in a good situation, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to speak against someone who's in a bad situation. So that's kind of the way I see it. I see that there are things that do need to be changed and the people at those levels can affect those changes. I vote. I encourage other people to vote as well and to vote your conscience, vote your priorities, vote your policies. But I myself am going to make the biggest impact where I am at the time. And if some people say it's time for me to change, then I wish that you I wish you all the best as you go make a difference somewhere else. Yeah, no, no hard feelings. Yeah, it was. Um, I, and I think that's a I think that's a great way to look at it, because I know plenty of people who wouldn't look at it that way. They're like. You're abandoning the mission of our institution. And so we're going to make sure your reputation forevermore reflects it. So, um, I, and you know, there are, but they're not, everybody's like that. And I think, that's, right. Some people do cut and run. I'll, I'll put that out there, right? Like not everybody who leaves, leaves the right way. <laughs> yeah. There's a proper way to, to exit a situation. And so like, if you were going to resign tomorrow, like what would the proper way to leave look like? Obviously you're not going to don't quit at Christmas. Don't use all your vacation days in April. Right. Right. I would say if you find that it's not a healthy environment and you do need to get out as soon as possible, I would say either hang on until you can find a replacement or give a definite timeline. Uh, we actually here had a teacher who came the first day of school and did not come back the second day of school. And I feel like that's kind of a disservice to the community because as teachers, we are a community wow. and we should have each other's back. Like, let's say somebody's out and they say, hey, you know, we can't find a sub. Can you cover during your conference? I am willing to give that for my coworkers because I also feel supported in that same way. But if I knew this is not the situation for me, I'm immediately going to let my admin know and I'm going to do this the right way and say, hey, we've got about six to eight weeks before the end of the year, let's start interviewing. Let's start working on bringing in a replacement and I will give you my best until I'm gone. I'm not down mm. for kind of deceitful practices like, Hey guys, I'll see y'all tomorrow. And then you're like, you're done. That's a little too shady for me. Like that teacher didn't even pack their classroom up. Well, it was a shared classroom. <laughs> oh, okay. I was about to say, uh, that really don't have much to do with what we were talking about. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Don't the Surprise. first day and then don't get to come back. It's like, uh, so yeah, I, I keep my optimism, but I understand some people are like, this, this is not for me. And we, I mean, we can talk about, you know, alt cert and degree programs and all that stuff too. Yeah. So, uh, let, real, real quick, let, let's, let's pivot towards that, uh, elephant in the room there. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that has, seemingly never ended uh <laughs> i still have it's like uh there's new variants just like there's new uh apple iphones uh models there there's a new one just about every few weeks um yeah so whenever the whole thing first started and the whole world shut down and school districts were like uh we really don't have the infrastructure for virtual learning because that's where I was at. That's what my school literally said. And we were a one, we did have the capability to go one-to-one -one and we did like that, but not every school had that infrastructure. The wireless wasn't there. Uh, right. The technology wasn't uh, across the board. So like that was what I, that was what my experience is. What's some things that you experienced that COVID put that, put that flashlight on that this was like, Hey, we weren't ready for this. And like, how, how did that, I guess, prompt conversations for change. Yeah. So I actually, I did a podcast. Uh, I have a six minute sessions where I cover life through kind of a teacher's perspective and a minister's perspective. And I did a teacher's thoughts on COVID parts one and two. And one of the main things that I focused in on was 
that this was a natural disaster. Obviously, people were getting sick, people were dying, but it was one that came without warning. See, here in South Texas, when a hurricane shows up, you see it coming. We've got time to board the windows. We've got time to gas up the generators. We've got time to get out of town. But with COVID, it was different because we knew like, oh, other countries have it. You know, oh, somebody in Washington has it. And then when the entire world just stops, like we were not prepared. But more importantly, the kids were not prepared. And that's what hurt me the most is that I've got these kids and these relationships and we know each other and I'm Mr. Six and they come in and they tell me how the game went. And, you know, do you have any snacks? Can I have a granola bar? And all of that is just gone. And there's nothing that we can point to. You know, there's no Hurricane Harvey that you can point at. Well, you know, that's how hurricanes are. There was no threat for terrorism where we're like, oh, okay, well, you know, those people, we need to go and stop them. Uh, it was just unprecedented in the way that there was no one to blame. And we were kind of left holding all this emotional turmoil in our hands. Like, what do we do with this? And then we lose socialization. So we can't even work through it together. Like kids at home with no internet access or faulty equipment. Now, all of a sudden, they're removed from all of their peers and they're removed from me, like you said, one of uh, a big source of their support system. So I think it was difficult all the way around because there was no precedent and there was no preparation. Yeah. And, and so since that has, I guess, life has come back to uh, a semblance of a redefined normal. Um, what are some adapting, things that... Yeah. Yeah, we're it's a, a evolution and adaptation. Uh, what are some things that's different now? Obviously, the relationships have got to stay the same for any functional classroom to work. But what are some things that probably will never go back to the way it was pre-COVID? Like, what do you what do you think are some things that have forever been changed by that pandemic? I think it's interesting, and it almost sounds wrong for me to say, but some good things that have come from the COVID-19 pandemic include uh, just an understanding of how important our systems are, not just our social systems, you know, like people were wondering, was my Amazon package going to get here on time? But the education system itself was put in the spotlight. And with the spotlight, we noticed some cracks, we noticed some, some gaps and some things that needed to be worked on. And I think that that's good attention. I'm not saying that, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. But what I am saying is how can we come back stronger from this crisis? And so now we're seeing how are we allocating our resources for both public, private, charter schools? What are we doing as far as staff development and taking care of the caretakers of our children? What do we expect from a school? What's the purpose of a school? Is it child care? Is it education? Is it uh, an athletic farm? And these are tough conversations, but in any relationship, tough conversations can lead to growth. Yeah, I think I think that's very well said. It just it forced it forced educators and ed, the education system as a whole to take that growth mindset, which yep. I th and I think for me, I discovered my I liked playing with the technology. I liked playing with cast. Oh yeah, Clapper. I love Nearpod. And so that pushed me to go get my master's of applied digital learning. Shout out to Lamar University, by the way. Uh, and, and so what's something in you that COVID brought out that you think has changed for the better? You, not the system as a whole, you personally. I think me personally, I've become more comfortable as a content creator. Uh, I've always been active in ministry and I've always been active in education, but the specific skill of communicating with a digital audience, I didn't have a ton of practice. Now, I've been producing podcasts and helping people launch podcasts for several years, but COVID forced me to consistently, I mean, I guess we can say when you're the only one in the house, you got to take a good long look in the mirror. So I think that it's helped me with uh, my cadence and my speaking, but also my empathy and understanding the struggles that other people go through because it's so easy to get in a rhythm every school year. This is me. This is what I need. These are my boundaries. You know, some people use that kind of as a scapegoat even. Right. But to see what are the needs of my students each and every year, because I tended to have a schema in place and the kids that would come through, I would say, where do you fit in how I understand the world? But when the world stopped, everyone had to reevaluate how they see the world. And so I, I approach each year as a new fresh year and say, where do I fit in bringing out the best in this child? And I think it's kind of shifted the way that I approach ministry and education as well. But as far as content creating, I have looked at 
so many different avenues and I've just burned through different technology. I've always been an innovator, always been an early adopter and bringing that excitement, I think has prepared me to better broadcast to the community, the good things that are going on in the school. And I feel like it's vital for teachers. I mean, you don't have to hop on the evening news and tell people what's going on in your school, but promote the good things wherever you can, the grocery store, your own personal social media. Now, again, I am all about separating personal social media from professional obligations. Mm -hmm. But if you want to brag, is I mean, I put it on my Facebook today. Like, look, guys, I'm in the paper. Look what these kids are doing. They're doing great. I don't feel like that's giving up my right to free speech or anything. I'm not a, a spokesperson for the district by any means. But use your gifts in the most effective way possible. So for someone, maybe you're not a content creator. Maybe you're like, man, this is really driving me to look at my content more. Maybe you become a really strong instructional leader or an IC, an instructional coach. Maybe you become that principal and you say, you know what, this has brought out some leadership activities that I, I hadn't been really addressing, but it brings those qualities to the surface. So for me, what it brought out for me is a gift of communication that mm -hmm. I've always had, but it just made it better. And coupling that with empathy in our new evolution and adapted normal, I think it's made me more effective with kids and with congregations.